Hello, and I'd like to give you an introduction to point-of-care ultrasound of the lung. This won't be completely exhaustive, and there's more that could be learned, but hopefully after this you'll have a much better understanding of what we're doing when we're placing an ultrasound probe on somebody's chest to evaluate their lungs. Here are some learning objectives that we'll be seeking to accomplish uh, during this brief session. And we want to start an understanding of lung ultrasound first with an understanding of anatomy. You remember that the lungs are within the thoracic cage and are separated from the ribs by a potential space known as the pleural space. In life, this is very small and contains only a few uh, milliliters of pleural fluid. When we view the lungs and the mediastinum via chest x-ray, we recognize that the lungs are extensively filled with air. Now when we use an ultrasound probe, we're imaging using sound waves. Sound does not travel very well through air. So if we look at the close interface between the lung tissue, the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura, and the soft tissues and bones that make up the thoracic wall, we will find that placing our ultrasound probe only allows imaging to occur to the level of the visceral pleura. This is very important when we think about what we should see in the normal situation of thoracic ultrasound. Let's talk for a moment about how to apply the probe to the patient. The ultrasound probe should always be oriented so that the indicator is directed cephalad. For imaging the lung, we place the probe in the intercostal space between two ribs. In this way, we try to obtain the best window for imaging of the lung. When you're selecting a specific probe for lung ultrasound, here are some key things to keep in mind. A high frequency probe is going to be best for more shallow structures. It's best for really examining the pleural surface. A low frequency probe can image structures that are deeper, particularly in pathologic situations. Uh, this is very helpful. Now if you're limited with time or resources to have only one single probe, what should you choose? Well, you want a probe with a small enough footprint that it can fit between the ribs. A very large curvilinear probe like you might be familiar with that's used in abdominal imaging would not be ideal because it would overlap the ribs and you'd have lots of rib shadow. And if you had to choose between high and low frequency, you'd want to choose low frequency so that you can image more far structures. You would also be able to see the near structures generally with adequate resolution. One important point as machines become more sophisticated is that you want to be able to designate the machine to be in thoracic mode, lung mode, depending on the machines these are referred to as different things, but the key feature is that these modes allow for artifacts. Many of the modern machines have algorithms that try to smooth out artifacts or echoes, but in the case of lung ultrasound as we'll see, it's these artifacts and these echoes that actually are informative for us. So let's start talking about that. As we understand what happens with ultrasound, we remember that the ultrasound only really images solid structures. It's only going to image, in the normal situation, the chest wall down to the level of the pleural surface. This represents muscle and soft tissue interposed between the visceral and parietal pleura. This bright white line representing those pleura shows what it looks like when they are opposed to one another. There's no space in between them. Now compare this to what lies below this line, and you will see there is a mirror image effect. This is because with air beyond the pleural surface, the pleural line acts as a reflector. It acts as a mirror for the ultrasound. Here's an example of what we look for when we're trying to obtain the best window for thoracic ultrasonography. What you see here, it's a slightly different probe, and so you see a more conical shape. However, you still have the skin surface here and the chest wall with soft tissue structures here. Notice the bright white line that occurs representing the visceral and parietal pleura. With this probe, it's a little bit larger than the previous probe, and so you also see black areas, anechoic areas, one on each side that represent the ribs. These are the ribs which block the ultrasound image and create 
acoustic shadowing. And so the black isn't just where the bone is, but it extends all the way to the edge of the ultrasound field. This is acoustic shadowing from ribs on either side, and here's the intercostal space. This configuration, where you see the rounded rib, the visible intercostal space, and the other rounded rib is referred to as the bat wing sign, named because it sort of resembles a bat with its two wings. This is a way to find a window for lung ultrasound. Now let's look at some lung ultrasound in motion. What you see is still the chest wall area to the pleural line, and then this appearance of mirroring that occurs after the pleural surface. What we also see in motion is that we can see what is known as lung sliding and the presence of A lines. We'll take these one at a time. Let's start with A lines first. An A line represents an echo of the pleura. Again, remember in the normal situation, there is air all beyond the pleura, and this creates an acoustic echo or a mirror. Notice that there is another bright white line on this image, which occurs at this level. This bright white line is known as an A line. You can also tell that this is an A line because it is equidistant from the ultrasound probe to the pleura as it is from the pleura to the A line. That means that this is an echo in a mirror. If this probe were deeper, we might see another A line somewhere around this level because it's a further echo. Here's the same image on the left, and here's a different representation of A-lines on the right. You see the different shape probe, but here's the bright white pleural surface, and here's another bright white line representing an A-line. What this helps to represent is that an A-line does not have to be continuous. It doesn't have to travel continuously across the ultrasound field, but yet it's equidistant from the pleura as the pleura is from the probe. Again, this is a normal finding in normal lung. If you image the patient using M mode, looking at a single slice of image across the pleural surface, what you will see is motion. So here, over time, there is no change in the soft tissue and the bony areas. And once you get to the pleural surface, you begin to see changes over time, motion over time. This is an example of lung sliding or motion of the lung over time in M mode. This M mode view is also described as the seashore sign, named because this looks as if there might be calm water out to sea, and yet here, sand, like a seashore. Let's look again at the video on the left, and you'll see the motion that's actually occurring on the video. If you examine the pleural surface during the motion, you'll see what we describe as lung sliding. People have described this in different ways. A common way is that it appears as though there is a colony of ants marching right along the pleural surface. You can see that change there. But whatever you help to uh, have as an image, be sure you can recognize that there is motion occurring across that pleural surface. It is occurring with respiration. As the visceral and parietal pleura slide across one another, uh, with inspiration and exhalation. Here's another example of A lines in motion. And this is a good example of more than one, multiple A lines. So, again, for orientation, probe is at the skin. Here's soft tissue and the bright white pleural line. Look at that line and recognize that sliding is occurring, there is motion there. A lines are present here, here probably even at this level as well. Equidistant from the probe to the pleura is the first A line. The second is equidistant from there, and then the third. Now we're going to start to talk about abnormal findings. What we talked about previously with A lines and sliding are all normal, but here's some abnormal things that we'll go through. This image represents the presence of B lines. B lines originate at the pleura and extend most often all the way to the edge of the ultrasound field. It is in fact normal 
to have one, two, maybe three B lines in a single field. But you can see in this example, there are multiple. There's clearly uh, 10 to 12 B lines represented over the course of this clip. B lines are thought to represent swelling of interlobular septa. These disrupt the ultrasound signal, creating this bright echo that travels all the way down uh, to the end of the field. These are B lines. We'll talk about clinical implications towards the end. Here's another example of B lines, and you can see the bright white nature of these. They move with the plural sliding. They change their configuration. The other description for these is known as lung rockets, as the perception is that they are coming in and out or being fired as the lung slides across uh, the plural surface. This is lung that includes a little bit of extra fluid, causing thickening of the alveolar septa. Or this fluid may come from hydrostatic edema, such as pulmonary edema from heart failure. It may come from infection, such as uh, uh, purulent fluid from pneumonia. This is a B pattern, and B lines are the predominant feature. Now we'll see an example of consolidation in the lung. This is a situation where the alveolar spaces have been replaced with fluid, pus, blood, something that has replaced the normal air. And so, in this example, we see the soft tissue. Perhaps we're seeing here the pleural line. Here's a rib and its associated shadow. And the pleural line is here, yet we do not see a very good example of lung sliding. And we do not see A lines. Neither do we see B lines in this example. We see an area here that appears to be soft tissue density with perhaps some respiratory motion, but this represents consolidated lung. Some have described this as hepatization because it resembles the liver. In this example, the sound waves pass through the lung very easily, and you actually see heart motion, pericardium, and cardiac activity at the far end. Here's an example of a couple of findings. In this patient, you have soft tissue to the pleural surface right here. Then from this point to the left, you see an area of consolidation. Not moving, not aerated, no A, no A lines, and there's no B lines. In this case, to the right, you do see B lines. Look, these originate at the pleura. They move with the pleural sliding, even though there's not much of it. Uh, and they extend to the end of the field. So in this example, this patient appears to have a consolidation at this area of the lung and an adjacent area of increased interlobular fluid. Perhaps this is from pneumonia and associated uh, edema or infection near that pneumonia. Now let's look at some examples of pleural fluid or fluid in the pleural space. When the visceral and parietal pleura have become separated from one another by fluid. Here we see the pleural surface at this level, and we see a very dark anechoic area. However, this anechoic area doesn't obliterate the tissue beyond it because this is not bone, but this is fluid. In this case, the fluid appears to be fairly simple. It's, it's, it's uniform in its, uh, in its echo. We'll see some examples where that is different. Of course, in this example, we also see the heart and cardiac activity. This may be a small strip of consolidated lung uh, that is adjacent to the heart in this example. Here's a separate example where we see an area of consolidated lung actually invaginating into the costodiaphragmatic sulcus in this example with dark pleural fluid to pause this with dark pleural fluid uh, adjacent to it. So another example of simple pleural fluid on ultrasound. Now this example also shows pleural fluid, but you can see that this is not uniform. As respiratory motion occurs, we see the pleural surface. 
we see a dark area of anechoic fluid, but within this we see strips. We see areas of complicated pleural fluid. Resist the temptation to refer to these as septations, instead using complicated pleural fluid as your descriptor. The reason I mention this is because the presence of these septations is not always correlated with firm loculation, and it is not always correlated with the exact same appearance on CT imaging, for example. Do not let the presence of these septations or these complicated features prevent you from at least attempting a thoracentesis if it is otherwise indicated. So we've seen a couple of examples where in abnormal situations lung sliding is not present. These can occur when there is consolidation, these can occur when there is pleural fluid, and so loss of lung sliding is not pathognomonic for pneumothorax. However, let's talk about what this finding uh, looks like and then what pneumothorax can show up as. Here's an example of a static image from an ultrasound. We see the pleural surface. We see an A-line in this region. And with the M-mode probe set to image in this area, over time, what is seen is different from what we saw before. Remember, in the normal situation, we saw this similar configuration of soft tissue above the pleural line, which really does not move over time, and there's no change. Below this line, however, notice that there is also no change. The lines are very straight. This represents absence of lung sliding, and this is suspicious for pneumothorax, consolidation, or pleural effusion. It is a very sensitive sign for pneumothorax, but it's not specific because it can result from either one of the other processes I mentioned. This appearance on M mode is referred to as the stratosphere sign. Different layers of the stratosphere can be imagined as this represents. It's also been referred to as the barcode sign, appearing like a barcode. Whichever one helps you remember that this represents lack of motion and loss of lung sliding, use that one. When you have abnormal lung ultrasound and the lack of lung sliding, you don't have your diagnosis yet. It requires more searching. Now here is a different example where we have what is known as the lung point. Notice very closely that here is the pleural surface. We see at the beginning of this clip no lung sliding present and then an area where lung comes together, comes to oppose the visceral and parietal pleura, and we do see lung sliding come into the field. If this can be located, this is pathognomonic for pneumothorax. It represents the exact point at which the air is separating the visceral pleura from the parietal pleura, and with respiratory motion, you see the visceral and parietal pleura come back together. Here's the same clip on the left showing you that lung point. And here's an example on M mode. The uh, visceral and parietal pleural line is here. If the M mode is activated in this region, what you see over time is initially, in this case, some lung sliding is occurring. We see that seashore sign just, uh, representing motion. But then at a certain time point, that motion disappears in the same location and we see lack of motion, that stratosphere or that barcode sign. This is known as the lung point. Finally, how do we take these things and put them together for clinical application? Well, one commonly referred to and utilized protocol is known as the BLUE protocol, bedside lung ultrasound in emergency. And when the BLUE protocol is used, it is generally done at only six points for the patient. These points represent four, which are known as the anterior blue points, when one on each side of the patient, known as the posterior lateral alveolar pleural syndrome point, or the PLAPS point, P-L-A-P-S. How do you locate these points? These pictures show you. The upper blue point is found when the two hands are placed next to one another. The left hand against the clavicle, in this case, 
the right hand following after the left. In the middle of the palm, just at the base of the digits, here on the left hand is the upper blue point, and on the right hand is the lower blue point. This can be repeated uh, in the mirror image for the patient's left side. The plaps point is located directly down from the lower blue point at the level of the posterior axillary line. Imaging these points can be helpful to discriminate the possibilities of diagnosis in an individual patient. So in a patient with some respiratory pathology, here's the protocol. I encourage you to look at the reference listed, become familiar with the protocol, to begin examining this and adding this to your physical exam of patients. Very briefly, you'll notice the blue protocol begins with an assessment of lung sliding. Is sliding present or is it absent? After that occurs, an assessment is made at the blue points. What is seen? Do we see an A profile, which represents A lines with lung sliding? Do we see a B profile, which, which represents a substantiation of B lines or lung rockets? Using these features and the presence or absence of lung point, we can find an overall accuracy of over 90% for diagnosis of respiratory failure or respiratory symptoms when performed by experienced operators. Another application of lung ultrasound, which is not yet as well studied and not as well supported as the blue protocol, is this example. This is the FALLS protocol, fluid administration limited by lung sonography. A perennial question, particularly in our ICU, is when is more fluid resuscitation indicated? This protocol provides a suggested way to implement the experience of the blue protocol, as well as limited cardiac ultrasound, but to help with clinical decision making at the bedside in the ICU. Again, this has not been as rigorously studied as the blue protocol, so further investigation is needed before recommending this as a routine part of our critical care practice. What are the next steps here? Well, if you have opportunity to practice thoracic ultrasound on healthy volunteers, here's some suggested steps. Practice imaging those three blue points on each side. Use your hands, identify the upper and lower blue points and the posterior lateral plaps point. Begin with a shallow depth on your probe. Identify the pleural line. Identify the presence of lung sliding. Increasing the depth of the probe, or looking 6, 8 to 10 centimeters, can you identify A lines? Remember, even in healthy people, you may identify 1, 2, or even 3 B lines in a particular ultrasound field. Do you see any of those? As you reach the posterior lateral aspects of the lung, identify the presence of the diaphragm and the liver on the right side and the spleen or kidney on the left side. Understanding the relationships of these anatomy making sure that you're keeping your probe indicator directed cephalad and the expected appearance of this on the screen. And finally, look for mirroring. Look for the mirroring that occurs at the pleural surface. This can also occur at the diaphragm and mirror the liver, interestingly, if you pick that up. So take some time, practice these. Uh, the best way to gain uh, comfort and experience uh, is just with practice. So reach out to your local experts and those who can guide you. Consider a formal course offered by many ultrasound or professional societies. And I wish you the best of luck with ultrasound of the patient uh, of the pleural surface and the lung. Thank you very much for your time.